Thank you, worship choir, for those two wonderful songs this morning. Thank you, great choir, for singing with heartfelt worship uh, this morning. I'm Pastor Jay, one of the pastors here at Crawford Baptist Church, and it's my joy and privilege today to preach God's Word uh, to you. And I've been preaching this to myself all week. And um, this morning, if you have a Bible, and I hope you do, if you'll turn to Psalm 128, Psalm 128. Uh, we are continuing our series of messages. We're coming to a, a quick conclusion to it, but we have been now uh, for a number of weeks, really uh, in the month of May and in June so far, we have been studying the topic of who's your one? Who's your one? And this is a Southern Baptist-wide campaign to get us to focus our prayer, our intentionality upon looking to the people that are in our networks, where we live, work, and play, that need Christ. And you may not remember this, but I do, because I laid out the series. Uh, On Mother's Day, we had our children's musical, which was fantabulous, amen, it was just awesome. (laughs) We're still singing those songs in our home and in our car and different things. And it's just wonderful what they did on Mother's Day. And I also brought a a brief message from Psalm 78 about parents that day and mothers, of course, um, knowing the gospel, teaching the gospel to your children. And today being Father's Day, we continue the series, Who's Your One?, but, but let me remind us all, let's not forget to look within our own homes for a one. And a father's responsibility to lead his wife and children to the Lord. This is a practice which is almost unheard of in Western Christianity today. And as I have mentioned in recent messages, there was a time in Baptist church life that you could be brought under the discipline of your church if you as the husband and father did not lead in family worship in your home. And that's been over a hundred years but we have lost something that is very important and precious to us. And, and I am just learning this too, okay? Um, I am no expert or master on this. If there's anything that I feel as if I fail in the most, it is being a father. Applying discipline inconsistently to different children in your home. Never seeming to be able to get it all just to work just right, the way you kind of envisioned it as a dad. Being tired, frustrated, aggravated, irritated at your wife, at your children. These are normal feelings that I honestly have in my own heart. And so I just want to get this out first because we're going to move on to some good stuff. Because normally on Mother's Day, we come in and we say, man, mamas are awesome. And then we come in on Father's Day and we say, man, man, you guys are slackers and lazy. And you really need to get your act together, guys, because you're lousy, all right? I mean, that's the normal Mother's Day, Father's Day pattern. And my question is, where is the gospel in either of those messages? You see, bottom line is our mother, our wives and mothers need the gospel of God's grace. And our husbands and dads need the message of God's grace as well. You see, God has not called us to be a husband father in our own strength now that's when we fail 
But the Bible says in John 15, 5, Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. And so objectives that we have at Crawford Baptist Church, and we have a number of them, and if you've been around for a number of weeks or whatever, you have heard these preached, and we try to keep hammering these in. We, we desire to uh, see God save hundreds and hundreds of people. We desire to see us equip Christian believers to be disciple-making disciples. One of our third overall objectives on one list is that we uh, train men to be godly men, husbands, and fathers. And that is very significant. And so today's message on this Father's Day 2019 is going to really focus a lot on that issue, of course. But as I mentioned in community group this morning, uh, it is applicable to women and wives and mothers and young people. I know our children are in here, um, and that's a blessing to have them in here on this, this Father's Day. And so let me say this. We are called by God as men to be godly men. And then the majority of you men in this room, when you hit about 18, 19, 20, within a brief period of time, you will be married, statistically speaking. Statistically speaking. And so we want to focus today on being, first of all and foremost, a godly man because out of the godly man flows being a god. You won't be a godly husband if you're not first and foremost a godly man. And then from godly man to godly husband, and then from that to being godly dad, godly father. You're the pastor dad in your home. And so today, this message, I want to be a message that is saturated with grace, not law. Uh, I challenge myself as I preach these verses in Psalm 128. We have six verses this morning to cover. And... um, and there's a lot for us to learn from God in these verses. But Psalm 128, I want to read the, the psalm to us. And really, of course, it, it goes right with Psalm 127 as well. And so let me go ahead and read Psalm 127, not to throw our, our media people off. But let me, let me read that, and then I'll read Psalm 128, which is what we're going to focus on this morning. Psalm 127, verse 1 says, Unless the Lord builds the house... Those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. Psalm 128 verse 1. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. You shall eat the fruit of the labor of your hands. You shall be blessed and it shall be well with you. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your children will be like olive shoots around your table. Behold, thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. The Lord bless you from Zion. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. May you see your children's children. Peace be upon Israel. And I want to lead us in a word of prayer before we dive into God's word. And if you are a uh, dad in the room, if you'll just stand here on the floor, in the balcony. If you're, if you're a dad, I want to pray uh, uh, for you, for us. As Pastor Jared eloquently put it today, there are men in this room who have children in their heart that have not yet come into uh, their homes and their lives just yet, but they are in their hearts as well. And so we want to pray for you. So I appreciate it if you'll just stand and let me pray. Father in heaven, I bow before you, Heavenly Father, thanking you that you are awesome. You are perfect. You are righteous. You are gracious. 
and you are merciful. And Father, this morning, these men, these dads, fathers, stand in your holy presence. And Father, we want to admit we do not have what it takes within ourselves. Father, this morning we look to you. We look to the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no name higher. There is none. No name sweeter. No name more powerful. And we look to the Lord Jesus as men today. As sinners. If saved, saved by grace. Kept by grace. Sustained by grace. And Father, today we admit that we need to abide in the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to abide in Him and that He would abide in us so that we might bear much fruit because apart from Jesus we can do nothing. And so, Father, thank You for these men in this room. And Lord, we admit today and we repent and we confess our sins and our struggles and our shortcomings and our failures. And we are, again, thankful for Your grace. That our past sin has been forgiven. That our current struggles are covered. We thank you that our future failures are already paid in full today. May that truth of grace saturate our hearts today and propel us to be godly men of God. And Father, I pray for families today whose earthly dad has gone from this life. Father, as Pastor Jared said, it's a hard day for many for different reasons. But I pray, Heavenly Father, that your love would be supreme in our hearts today and a source of strength and encouragement. I praise you. I thank you. As I wrote in my journal, I thank you, Father, for the privilege to be a dad. And I pray, God, that my children would see you in me. And the only way that happens, Father, is for the Holy Spirit of God, who indwells us as Christian men and women, to manifest your love and presence and grace. Lord, would you do that? We men, we fathers and dads, Need you today, O God, in a desperate way. Help us, Lord. Learn from your word. And, Lord, be glorified in and through our lives and through the lives of our wives and our children. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, men. You may be seated, dads, and you'll have your word open. We're going to walk through Psalm 128 this morning. I have six little brief bullet points just to go through. I would encourage you to write these down and then think about them later. Some people write in their Bible. Some people bring a notepad or have a piece of paper or journal that they write in. You know, a disciple is first and foremost a learner. And think about it. If you were on the job and you had to go to a training class for your job, and you're going to go hear a lecture about something that's going to be instituted in your office or your factory uh, on your job, uh, you would, and, and, you know, your job depended on that, you're probably going to be able to want to, want to remember what was being taught you. And so I think maybe in church we, 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 we hadn't thought of it that way, but to be a disciple is to be a learner. And the best way for me to learn is to hear it, and write it down. That's why in the last few weeks, and Pastor Ryan preached last week, and Pastor Jared preached the week before that, and Pastor Stephen preached the week before that, uh, when, they, when these guys preach, I, I take notes. I write it down. A disciple is a learner. So I'd encourage you to write these points down and then think through them uh, after the message has been preached during the week. Psalm 128. I'm talking today about fatherhood, disciple-making, and the glory of God. And one of the, the tragedies of our culture is today, we, we identify and label men 
based on the three B's primarily, and we neglect a fourth B. The first B is the billfold. I'm looking for a man that can make me happy. Big house, big car, swimming pool, vacations, all those kinds. I'm looking, so we look for a man on the basis of his build fold. Many in our culture look at a man on the basis of the ball field. Man, he's a hump. He'd knock it out of the park. He looks good in them baseball pants. I mean, just, just whatever. I mean, we, we base it on the ball field. The billfold, the ball field. The third B is the bedroom. And even Christian culture today, young people, high schoolers, college, young adults, we typically identify the kind of man we want as a female based a lot of times on those three B's, or at least one of those B's. It, can, can we agree to that? On one of those B's, I'm not saying you want a, a wealthy baseball player, you know, and, and other things. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying on at least one of those B's, there are a lot of women. And, and, and listen, God has called me to proclaim the whole counsel of His truth to His people and to anybody else that will listen. And I want to tell you that that we cannot be sold a bill of goods by this world and believe that the billfold, the the uh, ballpark, and the uh, bedroom are what we ought to be focusing on. That fourth B that I was going to mention is the Bible, the B I B L E. I mean, does that guy have what it takes to lead you as his wife and future father of your children as a priest, prophet, provider, and protector? Does he have that in the making? Now, the honest answer to that is going to be no. But is he heading in the right direction? I mean, men, can you remember when you got married? I mean, did you strut out from behind the doors over here? And, man, I got this thing figured out. And, bless God, I, I got it all under control. I mean, most of us are scared silly. I mean, we're more likely to pass out. Right. And when they open those doors, as we do here in the back, and then you see that bride in that bridal dress, oftentimes for the first time, and you see her, it's, you know, it's, Shazam! And you just want to, you know, you feel like past. Well, I keep saying, don't lock your knees, don't lock your knees. You know, <laughs> bend your knee, bend your knee. We, but men, God calls us to be the priest of our home, the prophet in our home, the provider, and the protector in our home. I'm not going to focus on those in this message. That would be another message at some other point in time down the road. But Psalm 128, notice verse 1. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord. Look down at verse 4. Behold, thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. Uh, the first thing that I want to point out to our attention today is this. The favor of God is is found in the fear of God. The favor of God is found in the fear of God. That word blessed in verse 1, it's also there in verse 2 as well. It says you shall be blessed and it shall be well with you there in verse 2 and again in verse 4. So we see that word repeated, the word blessed. It means happy in verses 1 and 2. There's a slight alteration in verse 4 where it means favored. Happy are you. Happy is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in His ways. You shall eat the fruit of the labor of your hands. You shall be blessed. You shall be happy, and it shall be well with you. Notice in verse 4, Behold, thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. So happiness... And, and being favored by God, listen, go hand in hand. 
And what we try to do is our minds are saturated with a worldly worldview, a secular worldview. We think we can find some happiness, right, in the billfold, at the ballpark, in the bedroom, or you fill in the blank. On, we, uh, some people live on a constant vacation. It amazes me. I don't know how they do that. But people are always looking for pleasure. They're always looking for joy. And here's the deal. God wired you and me that way. And here's why. Because He is our supreme treasure. God is the supreme delight of our souls. And when we settle for the stale bread that this world offers, compared to the splendors and the glory and the grace and the majesty and just the awesomeness of who God is, there is nothing in this world that can compare. We just sang that. Did we believe what we have sung this morning? And so happiness is anchored with being favored by God. So the favor of God is found in the fear of of God. And that word fear, look at it. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord. That word fear means to have a holy respect. It's to hold God in reverential awe. It's to have a big God theology, which we try to emphasize at this church through our music and through our community groups and through this pulpit. We want a big God theology. God is sovereign and God is big and God is holy and God is majestic and God is perfect and righteous and gracious and merciful. He's omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent. He's happy. He is ase. He is unchanging and in need of nothing. We have an awesome God who is the creator of everything and everyone that is. And blessed is everyone who fears. And that word fear also has the idea of trembling before God. It's, it, it's, it's where we grow to become fearful of bringing shame on the name of God. We were talking about that in community group too. Some of our people in the college career community group were talking about, you know, that, that, that when their parents say, you know, I'm not, I'm not mad at you. I'm just disappointed in you. That, that at a certain age, that kicks in. And when, when, the, when the parent says, I'm just really disappointed in you, man, that, that just grieves the person deeply. And I understand that. That came from me at one point in time. See, at one point in time, what grieved me was when JB would take the belt, and he was like six foot and 250 pounds, and so he would undo the belt, and it took a while for him to get it out from around him, and that was a dreadful time. But then it was even worse when he applied that belt to my seat of knowledge. Uh, children, y'all are in here today. Let me tell you, when I was growing up, and I was misbehaving at the uh, Winn Dixie, the A and P, or wherever Mama might have us out. If we were misbehaving, anybody in the store could spank us. And then when we got home, we got another spanking. It's not like today, where you know everybody's filming and trying to have uh, lawyers and litigation. wouldn't like that. I mean, just everybody's, you know, they kept you in line. And uh, it's not like that today. I understand that. But but I'm gonna say I understand what some of our college students were saying today in the community group about that because that happened for me. It, it came to be that that I didn't want to let my dad down. I didn't want to to have the displeasure. Of my, I didn't want to break his heart. And I think as we grow as Christian men and women, we grow in that ability where we desire not to grieve the Holy Spirit of God. In fact, we're commanded, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you've been sealed under the day of redemption. So that is a commandment in the Bible. But as we grow and mature as Christians, just as you grow and mature, hopefully, you know, physically and emotionally and in all those ways you increase in wisdom and stature and favor with god and man we, we we get to that place in our lives where i don't want to bring shame on my mom or my dad as we grow as christians we grow in that capacity to realize i don't want to bring shame upon god and so that's the idea of fear and so i have to ask myself you know uh does this question 
Do I tremble before God? Do I ever tremble before God? As a man, do 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 I do do I uh, tremble at the thought of doing something that displeases God? You see, blessed is the man who does not want to displease God. And so, point number one is this: the favor of God, the blessing of God, is found in the fear of God. Point number two this morning is this. The wisdom of God is found in the Word of God. The wisdom of God is found in the Word of God. Look at the rest of verse 1. It says, who walks in his ways. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord. And then notice this part, who walks in his way. So how can you and I learn God's ways, as it says in verse 1? And the answer to that, of course, is we learn God's ways through becoming familiar with who God is. How do we become familiar with who God is? We learn about God by reading His Word. This book is primarily not about you and me. This book is primarily about God. In fact, you cannot truly understand who you are unless you, first of all, truly understand who your Creator is because we have been created in His what? His image. The Imago Dei, the image of God. And so we we need to be, you know, in the Word of God. The wisdom of God is found in the Word of God. If you will hold your place in Psalm 126, and just go back to Psalm 1 for just a moment. The very first Psalm in the Psalter. Go to Psalm 1 for just a moment. It's right after the end of Job. Go back to the beginning of Psalms. You're already in Psalms. Just hold your place. We're coming back to it. But look at Psalm 1. Blessed, there's our word, blessed, happy, favored is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, right? Nor stands in the way of sinners. Who do you identify with? Who, who are your counselors? Who are your go-to guys when you have issues going on? See? So, so happy, blessed. Favored is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. Rather, notice verse 2, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. That's to be me, and that's to be you, right? But it happens by grace. As as God saves us, he gives us a heart, he gives us a desire. We, 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 We begin to delight in God once we're saved. And one reason we may not be delighting in God is because maybe we haven't been saved. It's not walking the aisle, signing the card, running through the baptistry, and everything is hunky-dory. It's not going through the membership class and signing the papers and the membership covenant, and, man, I'm in God's family, and I'm a part of Crawford for now, and I'll be there when I feel like it. That's not how it works. But God gives us desires and delights within himself. And if there's never been a change, may I plead with you brothers today, uh, men, men in this room, search your heart. Trust God. Turn from your ways and turn to God and be blessed, happy, favored is the man who, who walks in the counsel of God, who stands in the way of the righteous, right? Who, who, who sits in the seat of those who are humble before God, not those who scoff at the righteous. You see, the the blessed man, the favored man, delights in the law, the Torah of the Lord, of Yahweh. And on his law, he meditates day and night. Also, if you'll flip over to Proverbs for just a moment. If you're in 128, it's just a few pages over in your Bible. Proverbs 1, 7. Check it out. Proverbs 1, 7. It's on the screen. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Now, now, now that's a, it's a brief verse. It's kind of like a theme verse of the book of Proverbs. No, notice that again. The fear of the Lord. That, 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 that understanding God is holy and awesome and big. And I tremble before him. I am reverent before God. I feel as if we must re-educate the 21st century Western church attenders. In a reverence for God. We we seem to have lost that. 
Now, we have an intimacy with God, but we've lost a reverence for God. But notice it: the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. This is why uh, in learning anything, if God is not the foundation, but also the central focal point of our learning, are we truly learning? The fear of the Lord is the what? The beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Look at Proverbs chapter 9 and verse 10. Proverbs 9, 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One, that's God, is insight. And so for us to learn, God must be the foundation. He must be the central piece. He must be the lens through which we look through everything. We recognize God is the creator of all life, all physical matter, everything that is. It is God who has made us in his image. And yes, there's value for sociology and psychology and and, and English and mathematics. In fact, there are all of these things because God is a God of order and God is created and has a plan and a design. But notice it, the knowledge of the Holy One of God Himself is insight. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And fools despise wisdom and instruction. So let me ask you, what's your God time plan? Men, may I plead with you once again, have a God time. Have a God. You say, Pastor Jay, I understand. I just don't know how to go about that exactly. Let me tell you, next Sunday, for all of those who went through our Disciple Makers course, we are going to have a certificate. Pastor Stephen will have these printed out for us, and we're going to have these next week uh, when you come. And uh, we're going to have you come up, and we're going to give you a certificate next Sunday morning in our morning worship service. And we had about 40 people that finished that course. Different groups had leaders, and they did. And and, and here's the thing. If you're a man in this room, you say, you know, I really don't know how to do that. I know I need to, but I just don't really know. Listen, there'll be men standing right up here who could take you one-on-one and meet you at the Waffle House, the IHOP, Starbucks, in a room on this facility at your house or their house, and they can take you through a seven-week little study of basic discipleship. And that's just helping you learn how to read the Bible, how to pray, how to study God's Word, how to take notes during sermons and Bible studies, uh, that when you participate in those, and those kind of, just basic Christian living 101. That's all that is. We have men... Women, we have some youth who completed that course of study back in the spring. And we can help. You can just go to one of them when you see them up here next Sunday. We hand them their certificate. And you say, hey, I'd like to get with uh, Miss Pam, for example. Miss Pam's got somebody already, all right? But, uh, but there'll be others up here that you say, oh, I, I could go with Miss Anita. Or I could go with, you know, uh, Mr. So-and-so. I could go with Mr. Boogie. Or I could go with Mr. Benny. Or I could go with Mr. Champion. Or I could go with so And so we, we can pair you up. And get started on knowing how to have God time on a regular basis. And that's very, very significant. So does God's word flow out of you? Listen, your walk, your witness, and your work should be shaped by the fear of God and by the wisdom of God. Amen? I mean, who we are ought to be shaped because we have a holy reverential respect for who God is. And because of that, we we seek the wisdom of God, which comes from studying God's Word. So our work, our witness, our walk ought to be shaped by the fear of God and the wisdom of God. All right? And so, notice in verse 2, praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. I'm in Psalm 50. Let me go back to 128. This will work a lot better. Verse 2, Psalm 128, verse 2. All right, I was still stuck in Proverbs, sorry. Psalm 128, verse 2. You shall eat the fruit of the labor of your hands. You shall be blessed, and it shall be well with you. See, when you have the proper fear of God, and you seek the wisdom of God, you will be blessed. You will be happy, and you'll be favored by God. Verse 3. Point three, verse three. A wife 
is to be cherished as a treasure. Notice Psalm 128, verse 3. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine. Psalm 128, the first part of verse 3. Men, we are to treat, you should treat your wife as a great treasure. Know her, honor her, lift her up, support her, encourage her. The blessing of God is not found in a big house. It is not found uh, in a fast truck. Uh, It is not found um, in a um, huge retirement account. The blessing of God is found in your wife. Now, are are those other things wrong? To have a big house and a fast truck and a a good retirement plan? Absolutely not. Those are all fine things. Not not condemning them. But again, too often we, we settle for things under the sun to bring us ultimate satisfaction when nothing under the sun can bring you ultimate satisfaction. And God teaches throughout Scripture that if he who has found a wife has found a what? A good thing. And so marriage is wonderful. I love Dr. Vody Balkum and I learned a lot from him in his books. And he says, I wish I was born married. He said, marriage is so good. I wish I was born married. You know. Marriage is a good thing. And husbands, we are to look at our wives as a treasure to be cherished a treasure to be cherished know your wife love your wife serve your wife be with your wife go home to your wife wrap your arms around her every now and then snuggle up close she's your wife It is a good biblical thing to do. And listen to me. One of the greatest things that you can do for your children is to show them how much you love their mother. The Bible says your wife will be like a fruitful vine. That vine imagery speaks of faithfulness because a vine clings to something and it speaks of fruitful and that kind of uh, goes back even to psalm 127 when it says in verse 3 behold children are a heritage from the lord the fruit of the the womb a reward you see that your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house and so it speaks of the wife being fruitful and faithful to God and to you and to your family within your home. And so men today, it's, it's about us primarily, so here we go. The, the fear of God, the favor of God is found in the fear of God, right? The wisdom of God is found in the Word of God. Number three, a wife is to be cherished as a treasure. Men, by God's grace, not in our own strength, we can't. But by God's grace, let's strive in God's grace to be better at that. It's not legalistic works righteousness. By God's grace. Apart from Jesus, we can do what? Nothing. Number four, children are a gift to be nurtured. Amen? Children are a gift to to be nurtured. Verse 3 goes on to say, your children will be like olive shoots around your table. So that olive shoots imagery speaks of, of young plants, of course, that need to be nurtured, cultivated, trained. It also implies a long lasting impact because olive trees can bear and bear and bear and be very fruitful over time. And so we're not living just for the day We're living for the day. We're living for that day when we stand before the Lord and give an account of how we, by His grace, have lived as a godly man, how we have lived as a godly husband, how we have lived as a godly father. And so children are to be a gift to be nurtured. And I'll tell you, men, you will lead in your homes. You say, I'm not leading in my home. She makes all the decisions. Good, bad, and indifferent. I don't care. I work. I bring, I bring home the bacon. She fries it up in the pan. And she gives me what I want. 
or, or, you know, she gives me, you know, what she wants me to have. I am not the leader in my home. Uh, may I beg to differ? If you, if you have the male chromosomes within you, if you are a man, if you are a male, you're a male. There ain't no change in it. There's no imagining otherwise. That would be a psychosis because of human sinfulness. But if you are a man, God has designed you as the man in his image to lead in the home. And listen, men, you do lead. The question is, how do you lead? You can abdicate authority. Well, you're leading in doing that. And it's not good. Again, the question is, how will you lead in your home? What kind of example will you be before your children? And this is a line that I heard years ago, and, and, and I love it, but it's also so convicting and so challenging to me. They will be what they see. We can say that God is important. We can say that church is important. We can say that memorizing scripture is important. We can say, and you fill in the blank, is important. But what they're going to take away from that is what you do. And so your children are going to be what they see. And so if you worship on the river, or if you worship at the beach, if you worship at the ballpark, if you worship anywhere other than where God has commanded us to gather and assemble with his people, then you're leading your children. I'm not saying don't take vacations. I'm not saying don't do things. I'm saying that, that, that we, we live in an age where, where you know, we, we have all these things and activities that take God's time. God said, I, I want a day. We, we rarely call it the Lord's Day. I've been convicted recently. This is the Lord's Day. And we need a, a new respect of God, that fear of God restored within us. And, and we, we need a new understanding and reacquaintance with the concept of the Lord's Day. This is the Lord's Day. It's to be set apart from other days. It's what Christians have been doing since the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so we, we, need, we need that healthy Fear of God, not an unhealthy, but a healthy respect for the Lord and fear uh, fear of God. And we need to understand that the wisdom of God is found in the Word of God, that our wives are to be cherished as a treasure from God, that children are a gift to be nurtured. And here's the deal. We are nurturing them. We're nurturing them. And as the quote, which has been out on Facebook recently, if you teach your children to keep their eye on the ball and not teach them to keep their eyes on Christ, you have failed as a father. And I, I'm not up here as a righteous pastor throwing this out on y'all. Hey, that challenges me. That calls me on the carpet every day of my life, men. Dad's in this room. Am I, am, I, am I leading my children to have their God time? Am I talking with them about what they read in their God time? Am I willing to sit down and read the Bible with them and explain it to them? You see, there is so little of that happening today in the average church attender's home that this sounds like Greek. <laughs> but we want to have a culture here that cultivates godliness and it's got to start in the home. Listen, God created three institutions. The family and the home, right? Church and government. And do you know what the, 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 the kind of the, the foundation for the church and the government is? It's the home. It's the marriage and the home. And that's our highest earthly priority is that relationship between a husband and a wife under the lordship of Jesus Christ. And then we have that husband and that wife. And when God blesses them to become parents, uh, uh, you know, physically, biologically, by fostering, by adopting as we did. And there are many who have tried and tried and tried. And there are children who are waiting, waiting 
for a loving home, a loving dad, and a loving mother. And you don't necessarily have to wait. Say, so, well, if we have my, if we get our perfect two, just a word on that, they won't be perfect. They were just like me, perfect sinners. Now saved by grace, Amen. That's what it's about. But listen, there are children that need to be loved and cared for. In the state of Alabama, there are children that need to be loved and cared for. And so we need to open our eyes and have our hearts maybe widen to see that and, 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 um, and go in that direction today. Jesus is coming soon as we sing, and we believe he's coming. And there are children who can be loved on and pointed to Christ. Those children can become intercontinental ballistic missiles. That's a, a modern interpretation of Psalm 127, verse 4, like arrows in the hand of a warrior <laughs> are the children of one's youth. You have those kids, and you, you, you nurture them, and you bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord, Ephesians 6, 4. Right? That's what fathers are to do, to bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And then you can fire them out throughout the world to be uh, uh, servants of Christ and to, to, to spread the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what we see taking place. And so children are a gift to be nurtured. May God help us to lead well because our children will be what they see. Number five is verse five. The life that counts flows from the presence of God. And this is really the heart of this passage in a sense. The Lord bless you from Zion. Zion is a reference to Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the city where God's what existed? The temple, right? That Solomon, King David's son, was allowed to build. And so uh, the Lord bless you from Zion, from Jerusalem. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. This is, again, the Psalms are poetry, music. And so you interpret them as such. And so here we see imagery speaking about God's presence and God's presence being the blessing. And so listen, godly father, you are the source of blessing in your home for your wife and for your children. God's blessing flows to you and then to your wife and to your children. And so the life that counts flows uh, from the presence of God. Again, Let's have God time. If we don't know how, let's learn how. There are people here who will help you do that. I'm still learning to do it honestly after all these years of my life. But I love that time. You read the Bible and you pray. And if you will do that consistently, God will teach you stuff. It's a matter of delighting in him and wanting to do that. The life that counts flows from the presence of God. Everything God desires to accomplish through you, listen, is going to flow out of your intimacy with him. That makes sense? Everything that God desires to do through you is going to flow out of your intimacy with him. Number six, the life that counts advances the gospel of Christ for the glory of God. Verse six, may you see your children's children. And all the grandparents said amen. May you see your children's children. Peace be upon Israel. Amen. May you see your children's children. You see, the life that counts advances the gospel of Christ for the glory of God. We, we desire here a multi-generational legacy. Again, in my journal this morning, I put, Thank you, Father, for allowing me to be a dad. For a bunch of years of our marriage, I was not a dad. And God really put in our heart to become parents. And physically, we could not. But God, through His providence, brought us two precious children. And I'm forever grateful to God for doing that. God did that. It's a God thing. And and, and our goal, and our goal as a church is to see, you know, mom and dad 
disciple and train and discipline children who come to faith in Christ, and then they grow up, they get married, and they have children, and they disciple and nurture and train and discipline children, and then that just keeps going on and on and on. That's a multi-generational legacy of, of godly offspring. That's what we're shooting for. And, you know, Dr. Howard Hendricks said this in a quote, and uh, he says, if your Christianity doesn't work at home, please don't export it. Again, the, one of the supreme tests for me as a pastor, and for all of our pastors, is how well do we lead in our home? Biblically, if I fail at home, I'm not qualified to be the pastor. If I can't shepherd my home, I'm not qualified biblically to shepherd you. So if your Christianity doesn't work at home, please don't export it, Dr. Howard Hendricks. See, disciple-making begins, men, with your wife and then with your children. We are to act like men. Back, let me take you to the year 2012 as we wrap this up this morning. I hope you can jot these six points down we've covered today and then reflect upon them. They're constant challenges to me. And again, it's by God's grace that I'm able to fulfill any command in God's Word. This is so true. All the commands of Scripture, we are enabled to obey those commands because of the indicatives of Scripture. Because of who we are in Christ. But let me take you back to 2012 as we come to land the plane. In two events in 2012, let me start with July 20th, 2012 in Aurora, Colorado, in a century movie theater, three young men took their girlfriends to see a midnight showing of The Dark Knight Rises. This was in 2012. 20 minutes into the movie, a man slipped in a side door of that theater and he set off tear gas canisters. And he opened up shooting with a semi automatic rifle. When that bedlam broke out, these three young men who had taken their girlfriends, not their wives, but their girlfriends, when shots began to sound out, these three young men had their girlfriends pushed down onto that dirty, nasty floor of the cinema, and they laid their bodies over top of their girlfriends in order to protect them from this madman. These three particular young men all died in that attack in the movie theater. Bullets went through their bodies into the bodies of those three girlfriends, but the girls did survive the attack. Their boyfriends were buried the following week. The three mothers of those young men before the media they looked upon their sons as heroes for protecting the lives of their girlfriends. And the world applauded these three young men and others who had sacrificed to protect lives from this madman in the cinema. That was July 20th, 2012. Earlier in 2012, on January 13th, an Italian cruise ship, the Costa Concordia, capsized off the coast of Tuscany. 32 people were killed when that ship 
capsized and sank. There are widespread reports on that ship that there were men seen shoving and pushing women and children out of the way and down to the deck so they could get on the lifeboats first and preserve their lives. When this story broke back in 2012, there was universal condemnation. These men aren't real men if they're knocking women and old people and children down so they can occupy a lifeboat and survive. Pastor Jared mentioned that we gather once a month. Normally, we're trying to do this once a month with our men. We have a men's breakfast. And men, I just want to say, we invite you to our next one. We've got to schedule it, but we're going to have one. And we're studying on how to be a godly man, how to be a godly husband, how to be a godly father. It's a little book by Dr. Randy Stinson. And Dan Dumas, I believe, co-wrote that with him, I think. Dr. Randy Stinson was in his study watching his children play outside when they were smaller. He was in trying to work on a sermon, on a lecture. And he looked out the window, and he saw his little girl on a little tricycle, and she's just pedaling around on the tricycle like little girls will do. And his son was in a little red wagon. And his son would get in that little red wagon and he would roll down the driveway. And kind of like he's trying to win a race in the little red wagon. And on this afternoon, as Randy since has been working on the sermon, takes a little break, walks over by the window, and he sees his little girl down here at the end of the, the, the long driveway on a little tricycle just going around in circles kind of thing, you know. Just picture a little child doing that. And then here's his son kind of up at the top of the driveway near the house coming down the hill. And his son gets going in that red wagon and he pushes that red wagon and he hops in that red wagon. And he's going down, you know, the hill in that little red wagon. And Dr. Stinson is saying, "Uh uh-oh, this is not going to end well. So Dr. Stinson quickly runs out of his study at his home through the house, out the door, and as he gets outside, he, 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 he sees his son look up, and he sees his little sister, and, and his, little, his son, who is older than the sister, begins screaming, but she's kind of like a deer in headlights, frozen, right? She's just kind of caught, you know, she's kind of just frozen, and, and so Dr. Simpson says, my son, he, he started doing like this in the little red wagon rocking that little red wagon. And finally, before he got to the end of the driveway where his sister was kind of just stuck right there on her tricycle and he would just plow right through her, he was able to flip that little red wagon over. And he kind of rolled over and the wagon rolled over on him. He's got little scuff marks and cuts and nicks and he's a little sore and all that. And so Dr. Simpson runs out there and gets his son up in his arms and looks at him and he says, Son, are you okay? He says, Dad, I'm okay. I'm okay. And he said this to his dad. He said, you know, the boy goes down and the girl goes free. You see, Dr. Stinson had been teaching his children. The boy goes down and the girl goes free. And I say to every man in this room and to every woman in this room, Ephesians 5.25 tells us, Jesus went down so you and I can go free. You see, past sin is forgiven in Christ. Current struggles are covered in Christ. And future failures are paid in full already in Christ. That's good gospel stuff. There's not a day, dads, that I don't need to remember 
My past sins are forgiven, gone, obliterated by the blood of Christ. There's not a day in my life when I don't struggle with something. I do. I have already this morning struggled as a failure, as a father. My current struggles, though, because I'm in Christ, are covered by the blood. And my future failures are already paid in full. See, that's the gospel. And men and fathers and future fathers that are in this room and women and wives and mothers and boys and girls and youth and college students, whoever you are, the gospel is good news that the just and gracious God of the universe looked upon hopelessly sinful people and sent His only Son, Jesus Christ, God in human flesh, To bear his wrath against our sin on the cross. And to show his power over sin by resurrecting Jesus from the dead. So that everyone who turns from their sin and believes in him, in Jesus, will be reconciled, made one with God. That is good news on Father's Day. It's good news on Mother's Day. That's good news every day.